Apparently the camera on my phone is fitted with a 24 millimeter lens. Liar. Apparently this is a 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8. Liar. Apparently this 35 millimeter f1.4 lets in twice as much light as a 35 millimeter f2. Liar. And apparently this 18 to 250 millimeter f3.5 to 6.3 is a macro lens. Lying. Okay, maybe lying is a bit of a strong term because to be fair, manufacturers aren't technically lying per se. However, the way they measure some of the attributes of their lenses and the way they advertise their lenses, plus the way the public perceive that information can lead to people getting the wrong impressions about some lenses and how they work. Most notables of which are going to be the focal length, the aperture, focus breathing and the use of the word macro. So to start off with, what is focal length? Now I have done a more in-depth video in this called the science of focal length, which I'll link up here. If you haven't already seen it, I urge you to go and check that out. But as a, a quick recap, in a lens, there's lots of glass elements and these glass elements will manipulate the light and, and distort it, etc., and spit an image out the back. However, you may have noticed that the image that comes out of the back of the lens is always inverted. And that's because the light lines inside the lens actually cross over. And at the point where these cross over is called the point of convergence. Now the focal length of a lens is a measurement from the point of convergence to the camera sensor. The same physical focal length on a lens can give you different angles of view depending on the sensor size that you are dealing with. For example, this is a 16 mm f1.4 designed specifically for APS-C cameras. This is a 16 to 35 mm f4 designed for full frame cameras. Now, at 16 mm, both of these lenses have the same physical focal length of 16 mm. However, the angle of view that they project is different because this is projecting from 16 millimeters away from the sensor, big enough to cover a full frame sensor. Whereas this is projecting from 16 millimeters away from the sensor, just big enough to cover an APS-C camera. So the angles of view are actually different. Incidentally, the angle of view that these 16 mil lenses will portray on an APS-C camera is the same angle of view that you would get from about a 24 millimeter focal length used on a full frame body. Hence we say, that this has an effective focal length of 24 millimeters. And this is where camera manufacturers can sometimes exploit effective focal lengths. Most notably, it's used in things like smartphones or compact cameras or bridge cameras, anything where there's very small sensors at hand. Very rarely do manufacturers really push and advertise the physical focal length that they're fitting on their cameras. They advertise the effective focal length. Take, for example, the Nikon P900 bridge camera. Now that thing's well regarded and a very popular bridge camera because of the insane focal range that Nikon advertise of 24 to 2000 millimeters. If you look at the top of the camera body, you will see the physical size of the lens on that camera is only 4.5 millimeters up to 357 millimeters. But due to the very small sensor and the crop factor, it gives you the same angle of view as a 24 to 2000 millimeter lens would on a full frame body. So that's effective focal length, but the physical focal length can also be misadvertised and misinterpreted as well. So this, for example, 85 millimeters, the odds are that the point of convergence of this lens is not precisely 85 millimeters away. There's no doubt a tolerance of plus or minus a couple of millimeters either way, and then they just round the figure up to something that's more understandable for us. You see this in things like telephoto lenses, for example, the Sigma or Tamron's 150 to 600 millimeter lens. They're advertised as having 600 millimeter focal range on the long end. But when you compare them up against a 600 millimeter prime lens, you actually see that they're not quite 600 millimeters. They're more like maybe 560, 580 millimeters. I've seen it in some of my own lenses as well. For example, the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter. When I first got this, I also owned the Sony 28 millimeter F2. And I did a side by side comparison of them. And I found that the Sony 28 mil gave a slightly wider field of view 
than this. So either the Sony is slightly less than 28 mil and or this is slightly longer than 28 mil. Now the odds are you're never really gonna notice these differences in the real world. It's only if you put the two lenses up side by side in a direct comparison that you would ever really notice the difference. Now, moving on to aperture, the bane of most new photographers' lives, trying to get their head around f-stops. So f-stops are a ratio. It's a ratio of the focal length to the diameter of the aperture opening. So let's say, for example, with this lens, a 55mm 1.8, that the maths is going to be too complicated on. So let's pretend that this is a 50mm f2. The f2 would mean that there is a 2 to 1 ratio of focal length to aperture. The focal length is 50mm, so the aperture would be about 25mm wide. This is a 70 to 200mm f4. So at 200mm and at f4, there's a 4 to 1 ratio. That means that the aperture would be about 50mm wide. Now let's pretend that this lens, like our other pretend lens, is also an f2. So at 200mm f2, the aperture would be 100 millimeters, so four times wider than the aperture of this. But the focal length is four times longer as well. And as you increase the focal length, you narrow your angle of view, you're cutting out how much light is able to enter the lens. So what you gain from having the physically wider aperture opening, you cancel that out by having the longer focal length. Hence, you're always taught when you're learning photography, that two lenses of the same aperture number will give you the same exposure. However, this isn't entirely true either, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, like the focal length, the aperture value is bound to have been rounded up or down slightly to the nearest whole value. The other factor is that the aperture only gives you a theoretical idea as to how much light should be passing through the lens. It's not an exact measurement. This is where the difference between f-stops and t-stops comes in. So f-stops only tells you how wide the aperture is, so you should know roughly how much light is getting through the lens. However, there's no one way for a manufacturer to design the optical layout of a lens. So a lens is just a tube with lots of glass elements inside that the manufacturers will design in order to manipulate the light to project the image that they want. The more glass that they use inside the lens, the more flexibility they have over controlling that light, and thus, in theory, the better the image quality out the back that you should get. But while glass does a pretty good job of letting light pass through it, it doesn't let all the light pass through. Some of the light will be reflected back. So the more glass that you've got inside the lens, the more of that light it's going to reflect back, the less of it's going to get out the back of the lens. So just because you have two lenses of the same aperture value doesn't necessarily mean they're going to let the same amount of light get through. Again, case in point, the 85 1.8. On paper, this is two thirds of a stop darker than a 1.4 lens like the Sigma 85 that I tested it against. However, when I did my comparisons, I found that this was actually less than two thirds of a stop darker. It was only about a half a stop darker. But if you want to know exactly how much light is getting through a lens, then you go off t-stop values, because t-stop is a measurement of what comes out the back, not what theoretically should be getting through. Stills lenses are pretty much always in f-stops, but cine lenses are pretty much always in t-stops. Even if the cine lens is derived from a stills lens, the manufacturer still quotes it as a t-stop value rather than an f-stop. And if you're curious to know how much light is actually getting through your stills lenses, then websites like DxOMark actually measure the t-stop value for all of the lenses that they test. Next, we come on to focus breathing. And focus breathing kind of links back into focal length. So like I said at the beginning, focal length is the measurement from the point of... You remember what focal length is, right? The tricky bit that people overlook sometimes is that manufacturers only ever quote the focal length when the lens is at infinite focus. However, when you're focusing a lens, the glass elements inside the lens start moving around. And this can actually manipulate and change the angles of view that we start to see. So for example, if I compare up these two lenses, the 70 to 200 versus the 18 to 250 millimeter. So I tested both of these on the Sony a6500. 
and when focusing at a subject a few hundred yards away, this produced a slightly tighter shot than this. So that follows the rule that the 18 to 250 does have a longer focal length than the 70 to 200. However, when I then shifted to a subject that was only about eight feet away from the camera, I was having to obviously focus closer, that was turning out to be manipulating the focal length of the lens. And you can see that the Sony actually produced a slightly tighter crop than the 18 to 250. So just because your lens has a focal length capable of 200 millimeters doesn't necessarily mean you will always get that focal length depending on what you're trying to use the lens for. If you want to know whether your lens suffers from focus breathing or not, then simply pop the lens on the camera and then either looking through the viewfinder or on the back screen, rock the focus from infinite to minimum and back again and watch what the subjects in your frame do. On a lens with zero focus breathing, all the subjects will remain the exact same size in the frame, regardless of where the focus is. If the lens has focus breathing, however, the subject size will start to shift. And depending on how much the subject size changes by, will show how severe the focus breathing actually is. In the case of the 18 to 250, you can see it has quite a noticeable change in how big objects appear. And this links us on to the last bit, which is the use of the term macro. Now you say macro to a photographer, you immediately think close up shots, high detail shots of things like flowers and insects, etc. However, manufacturer's idea of macro is slightly different. And for this, we need to know what reproduction ratios are. So reproduction ratio is referring to how big the object appears on the camera sensor when the picture is being taken. So true macro is deemed as one to one. That means, for example, if we were to take a picture of a one centimeter square, the image that the lens projects out of the back onto the sensor, that object will appear on the sensor as a one centimeter square. Or if I was to use a full frame camera with a one to one macro lens and I took a picture of a full frame sensor, then the sensor that I took a picture of would fully cover the sensor that I'm taking the picture on. I hope that makes sense. If I was shooting at a reproduction ratio of one to two, the object will appear half life size on the sensor. One to three would be a third and one to four would be a quarter, etc. Now, if I remember correctly, macro is deemed as anything with a reproduction ratio of one to four or higher. So as long as a manufacturer's lens has a reproduction ratio of more than a quarter, then they are allowed to use the word macro on it. Now, reproduction ratios are based around two factors, your focus distance and your focal length. So obviously, if you want to see, you know, the very small hairs on an insect, you need to get very, very close to the subject. Now, if you're using a really wide angle lens, that means you have to get incredibly close in order to see them. And odds are you still won't pick up all the detail. But you can offset that with a longer focal length because the longer focal length, the narrower angle of view means that you crop into the image a lot more. You can pick out that detail a lot better. However, a longer focal length usually then means a longer minimum focus distance. So for example, this 35 mil lens has a minimum focus distance of about 30 centimeters. Whereas this 85 millimeter lens has a minimum focus distance of about 80 centimeters. And this 70 to 200 at 200 millimeters has a minimum focus distance of about 1.5 meters or 150 centimeters. This, however, is the IRIX 150mm f2.8 macro lens, and despite the 150mm focal length, this has a minimum focus distance of 34cm, so about the same as the 35mm lens. So these might be working at the same distance, however, the greater focal length of this means that you're seeing a much smaller section of the scene, so if you're dealing with small objects, this picks up those details a lot better. However, this is where focus breathing can then rear its ugly head and confuse things again, because with the 18 to 250 mil, this thing's taking a battering today. Both of these lenses contain the word macro. However, the results that they produce look very, very different. And based on the paper specs of them, the results are the complete opposite of what some people might think. So this we've already established, 150 millimeter focal length, minimum focus distance, 34 and a half centimeters. This maximum focal length, 250 millimeters, minimum focus distance, 
35 centimeters. So on paper, both of these can shoot at the same minimum focus distance, but this has a focal length 100 mil longer. So you would think would mean that your subject appears bigger. However, because of the severe focus breathing of this lens, at minimum focus distance, this lens is nowhere close to 250 millimeters. In fact, judging by the looks of it, it's probably barely about 80 millimeters. As a result, the reproduction ratio of the Irix is a true one-to-one -one life size. The reproduction ratio of this is only about one to three. So there you have it. Just because a lens says that it's macro doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to produce the macro shots you're expecting. Just because a lens says that it can go up to 250 millimeters doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to go up to 250 millimeters. And just because a lens says that it might be a third of a stop brighter than another one in terms of f-stops doesn't necessarily mean that your images will be a third of a stop brighter. But as always, guys, if you have any questions or queries, the comment box is down below. Thank you so much for stopping by, and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.